showers bring May flowers, or so they say. In Maine, it's more like April snowstorms bring, well, still May flowers. And this first plant, though not at first apparent, is no exception. In fact, it's probably one of the first flowers to appear on the landscape, though you may not have noticed it before. This is Simplocarpus fetidus, or commonly known around here as skunk cabbage. This is a very cool plant. It's common throughout the eastern half of North America, from Nova Scotia and southern Quebec, west to Minnesota, and south to North Carolina and Tennessee, where it starts to get much more rare and has a protected and endangered status. It gets its name because it stinks, and when the leaves begin to unfurl, it resembles something like cabbage leaves. And if you bust it open and give it a smell, it stinks. Oh. It's easy to notice around streams in early spring when there's not much green growing. There's no leaves on the trees, and I noticed these standing out while driving around in the first week of May here in Maine. It has what is called an obligate status in plant terminology, which you'll see in your guidebooks. This means that if you see this plant, you are in wetland habitat. We could go into a little technical lesson on this in the future because there's a bunch of terms like this that let you know if a plant is always in a wetland, sometimes in a wetland, or never. Now I've never caught this plant early enough to see its very funky flower, but while researching it, it reveals some very cool characteristics of the plant. I'll have to keep a lookout a little earlier in the spring next year because it actually is one of a small number of thermogenic plants that can raise its temperature about 30 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit above the surrounding air temperature. It has to do with some fancy chemistry involving cyanide resistance in the cell's respiration, but that's a little bit too complicated for me in this video. This lets it melt through ice before much else is growing, and you can see that here in this picture. If you tear the leaves, you'll get hit with that unmistakable odor that gives the plant its name. But the smell is strongest when the flower is coming up as its primary purpose is to attract carcass-loving flies that serve as its primary pollinators. Like this blowfly, Califora vomitoria, which has a name that makes it a match made in heaven for Simplocarpus fetidus. Some speculate that the odor may also deter larger mammals from disturbing the sensitive soft soil of its wetland habitat. Supposedly, the leaves and roots can be thoroughly dried and were a traditional food and medicine across this continent. I'm not keen on experimenting on that myself though, so you'll have to explore that on your own. Now I was struck looking at this flower. That interesting bulbous looking thing inside the flower is called a spadix which is technically just a fleshy stem with many smaller flowers on it. The leafy hood is called a bract, and it reminded me of this big fat peace lily I used to have in my apartment. You can get these commonly in big box store plant sections or your local nursery. And doing a quick search confirmed my hunch that these two are distantly related in the Araceae family, also known as the Arum family which includes something like 3,750 known species. I thought that was a cool coincidence, and it's one of my favorite things about plant ID. I've mentioned it before in this series. Seeing the evolutionary relationships between plants around the world is a fun way to cultivate curiosity and introduce others to biology. Now this next one is also an early flower that I saw lining the sides of the road in the gravel and you may have mistaken it for dandelion because the flower and seed pod do have some similarities. They are both part of the daisy or asteraceae family which comes from aster for star. But if you compare the two there are a lot of stark differences. We can bring up the dandelion on the right here and you'll notice our new plant has a scaly stem while completely missing any prominent green leaves at the base. That is, until the leafy portion of the plant appears after the flower has pollinated and gone to seed. This gives us our clue to its common name, Colt's Foot, or Tussilago farfara. It's got a number of other common names around the globe in many different languages, often referring to the general hoof-like shape of the leaf. The plant completely ditches the flower stem after it's served its purpose and then devotes the rest of the year to growing big, round leaves to photosynthesize energy 
before it returns back to the soil to become dormant for the winter. It is a perennial, so it will come back from these roots year after year and can spread through both its seeds and its rhizomes. It's actually an introduced species, which you can see here on this USDA map key showing its distribution in North America. You'll have noticed in the videos I took how happy it is in rather poor soil, and is commonly found around the globe from Northern Europe to Russia, through China and North Africa, where it happily colonizes disturbed soils, one of the many plants that serve a function of fast repair of bare ground. For this reason, it is often classified as an invasive species or noxious weed by various governmental bodies, but I've never really found it out competing anything in our state. Perhaps it's different elsewhere, but I generally think that many plants that get this designation are mostly overreactions. There are of course exceptions, like kudzu down south, but that's another discussion. All right, so we've added two more to our list of 100 Maine and New England plants, and I have some more lined up. I want to go small and cover some mosses, and I'd like to cheat a little by including lichens, which are not plants but fungi that have a symbiotic relationship with different plant-like cells like algae and cyanobacteria, allowing them to get energy from the photosynthetic abilities of those microorganisms. Some of them resemble mosses very closely, so I think maybe it will be okay to cheat and include them in our list, but let me know what you think in the comments. Should I include lichens in the list? If so, are fungi in general allowed? Because I'd love to throw some mushrooms into the mix. Or maybe I should start a separate series of Fungi of New England. What do you think? Let me know below. Thanks for watching guys, and if you like this series, feel free to click that like button, subscribe, or comment below to tell the YouTube algorithm that this is content people want to see. Thanks again. Peace out.